Okay, <clears throat> so this video is going to take you through uh, Unit 4.4, Economic Integration, and also to look at the high-level topic of monetary union. Uh, so to start with, just looking at economic integration, it's a relatively straightforward uh, topic. Um, and we can talk about tr um, a trading bloc or economic integration being a group of countries who have negotiated preferential trade agreements between themselves. Um, I mean, in a sense, what countries recognize is that the benefits of free trade, and if you're high level, you know, the whole comparative advantage, absolute advantage uh, theory, but the benefits of free trade is something that they aspire to, but they also realize that the world uh, is a very complex place and that uh, the chances of negotiating preferential trade agreements with everybody in the world uh, heading towards, you know, I guess essentially what the WTO would like to see is very difficult. So in order to get around that, they form little clubs, little groups of countries uh, that they can manage to operate successfully within that group and negotiate some sort of free trade agreement between them. So there's a bit of a spectrum, really, of integration. Uh, we can just have a very basic preferential trade agreement where, as the name suggests, um, certain countries are given preferential uh, sort of treatment. And then in the trading blocks themselves, we have these one, two, three, four different examples. So you have your free trade area, a very basic trading block, and within that, um, they have free trade between the members, but they retain their own independent right to impose tariffs or quotas on any non-member to whatever level they want. Um, the next stage would be to turn that into a customs union, which is the same as a free trade area, but now would include common external tariffs against non-members. And then next jump, I guess, is a common market, which then adds another layer of uh, interdependence, uh, which is that there's freedom of movement of factors of production within the group. Right? And then finally, economic and monetary union, where you have all of what we've just talked about. Plus, we're looking at a single currency being introduced and a degree of fiscal and monetary interdependence as a consequence. Now, that's obviously where we got to with the European Union, formed in 1957 uh, as a customs union, uh, sort of free trade area, now has developed into a sort of economic and monetary integration for most of the members of the European Union. There's a map just showing you who are the members of the European Union. Um, you'll all be aware that uh, Brexit, so-called, took place uh, a couple of years ago, so the UK left. Uh, the EU, and there's a couple of countries who aspire to join. Um, but at the moment, I think there's 27 uh, member countries completely. So whenever you talk about economic integration, so to tie in with like, the motivation behind it, the economics of it is all to do with the benefits of free trade, globalization, free markets, you know, competition, efficiency, low prices, choice, all of the stuff you would talk about just in general with free markets and the benefits of, of competition you would talk about here. There's our list from the, from the subject guide. Um, so the advantages of trading blocks are given as trade creation. That's just high level idea. Uh, then access to markets, um, giving you potential economies of scale, free movement of labor, things are cheaper. Um, you, you become politically stronger. They could be all advantages, disadvantages, trade diversion, again, high level only, loss of some degree of sovereignty, and the challenge overall to multilateral trade negotiations like WTO. There's a quick um, summary of trade creation. So trade creation is a good thing. If you join the uh, EU, for example, uh, trade is created as you know you have access to these markets and you can buy from the cheapest source. Um, trade diversion is not a good thing, so that would be where actually joining the customs union um, means that you have to move to a, a higher cost producer. And the example there, the UK used to have a close relationship with New Zealand before they joined the EU. The UK would buy lamb from New Zealand without any tariffs, 
On joining the EU, the UK had to accept a common external tariff on New Zealand lamb as part of the deal, making New Zealand lamb more expensive than EU lamb. So the UK switched to buying lamb from the EU. So it's moved from a low cost producer, New Zealand, to now a higher cost producer, which is, is the EU. So it's not all beneficial from joining. Um, you can have a look at that uh, cartoon, see what you make of it. And a little bit about Brexit, it might be worth just studying the reasons why uh, the UK decided to, um, to pull out of Europe a couple of years ago. It's quite a big move, um, which some people agree with and others don't, of course. So moving on, um, just for higher level, uh, there is a section also in 4.4 on economic integration about the monetary union. Uh, monetary union is where the group of countries adopt a single currency. So we've got that, the euro in Europe. Uh, there are 19 countries who have uh, who now use the euro. Not So not all of the members currently use it. There are countries who are looking to join um, when the conditions are right. It's not straightforward. Denmark have voted never to join, as did the UK, actually, while it was a member uh, of the EU. So the EU talks about various convergence criteria. Essentially, what you want to try and do if you are um, hoping to get countries to, to, to join a single currency is to think about your very clumsily drawn trade cycle like this. And what you want to ensure happens is that every country is at the same point on the trade cycle. Uh, there's no point having a country here. They're just reaching, they've gone through a bit of a boom. Economy is doing very well. And then another country in the group is down here that are just, you know, in a recession. Um, that's not helpful. It's not going to work very well if you've got countries out of line in terms of their business cycle. The reason for that is that when you join a single currency, uh, essentially um, you lose monetary sovereignty, it's called. In other words, the central bank of the union, in this case, the European Central Bank, take care of interest rates and the money supply and countries themselves no longer uh, run their own, have their own influence over interest rates and the money supply. So there's one set interest rate for the whole of the Eurozone. Um, that wouldn't work if countries were not aligned on their business cycle, because look, this country here, a country A, probably experiencing a bit of inflation and realizing that, you know, it's sort of maybe it's pushed the economy a bit too far, it's overheating. They might want to bring in higher interest rates to sort of try and soften the uh, impact of high inflation. Whereas this country here, country B, in a bit of a recession, they might want low interest rates to give the economy a bit of a boost. So you have to have every country at the same point. Well, that's why they have the convergence criteria. So before you can join, that's why those countries haven't joined yet, because they're not quite right economically. Uh, to join, it would put too much pressure on the system. So these are the things that you have to have before you join. Um, so harmonize, uh, consumer price inflation needs to be relatively the same in all countries. Government needs to reduce their deficit and their debt. Long-term interest rate needs to be no more than 2% above the rates of the three best performing member countries. And you need to have gone through, participated in the exchange rate mechanism uh, in this case, ERM2, it's called, uh, for two years without there being any problem. Right. There's a quick slide there just sort of showing you how, explaining how it all works, a little bit of detail. Um, but something you for sure need to be able to talk about and discuss are the benefits, costs and benefits of monetary union. So here's the list of the benefits of monetary union. Uh, you do remove transaction costs, like there's no commission charges now because you don't change currencies. Greater price transparency, it's easy to compare prices in different countries, it encourages trade, encourages investment, and everybody's committed to low rates of inflation because they've all, you know, all on the same page with regards to managing their macroeconomy. So those are the benefits, uh, disadvantages of monetary union. Uh, the first two are really just when you initially join, uh, there's transition costs, people are unfamiliar with the new currency, maybe they're taken advantage of when the prices are adjusted. 
shouldn't really happen too much because there's always a, a slowish period of transition into the new currency. Um, I remember when the EU, um, the euro came came about. Everything was priced in both euros and the French franc, or the, depending on where you were, the Italian lira, Deutsche Mark. For a, sort of six months before, you go into a shop and there'd be both prices. So people became very familiar with what the exchange rate would be. There are some changeover costs, like all the ticketing machines, cash tills, vending machines, they all need to be changed over. So it's a one-off. This is a big one though, loss of monetary sovereignty. We're just talking about that. Um, shouldn't be a problem if you're all in line, but of course you might start off in line, but then countries sort of drift apart a little bit. We've seen that happen with Greece over the years. Um, and they got themselves into a bit of financial debt as a consequence. Um, but you do lose that monetary sovereignty to control your own interest rates. You also lose some fiscal sovereignty. So <clears throat> fiscal, remember, refers to taxation and government revenue. And although there's no controls on the amount of tax, well, I mean, things like VAT are sort of standardized in Europe, but other than that, countries are independent in terms of what their taxes can be. Um, you are obliged to keep your government debt in order. And so in that respect, you do lose some flexibility in your fiscal sort of measures. You've got to keep that in mind. You can't just go your own way completely. Uh, you have to follow some rules that the EU set out. A uh, risk of asymmetric shock is when one region or one area or one country goes into a recession, perhaps, and no one else does. And then that throws into doubt, you know, again, how what we do with interest rates and try and sort of solve that. Um, and then another the final dis disadvantage there is a loss of political sovereignty. I mean, it doesn't come as a, you know, as a given, but, you know, for some people that becomes problematic. Others embrace it and think, great, I don't mind that. You know, you perhaps we'll move towards the United States of Europe. There's nothing wrong with that. Have a federal government. Some people will be supportive of that. Very much depends on your own political views, not so, not so much an economic uh, factor. Um, there's a slide here just about, you know, writing a paragraph or more on the advantages and disadvantages and an example of how you might do that. The bit in blue is just the detail and then the bit in red is the sort of discussion part of that. Uh, and then, of course, it's an AO3. So the more you know about the, and the EU is a great place to start because it's like the best example of where we've got a single currency, of course. Um, so the more you know about it, and the more research you've done, the better you can do in any AO3 type question, particularly paper one, question B. Uh, so I'd encourage you to do more research in that area.